Vietnam veterans here today. Um, Clyde Hope was a U.S. Marine Corps platoon tank commander in Vietnam, and he is a military history author, as well as the president of the Veterans Brotherhood. And Bob Pullen is also here. He was an Army sergeant and radio telephone operator for the 1st Cavalry Division in Vietnam. And he's the vice president yes. of the Veterans Brotherhood. So I welcome you both. Thank you so Thank you. much for taking the time to come here and sharing your stories. Clyde and I are going to discuss uh, growing up, <clears throat> school, family, entering the service, Vietnam, coming home, work, PTS, and PTSG, PTS growth. I was born in Dallas, Texas, moved to Mount Airy when I was one, uh, and then at age two moved to Orland. My uh, parents established a coal yard and a hardware store there. East Orland was a town uh, noted for its lime deposits and ore. It was also a farming community until after World War II when the returning veterans were coming in at such numbers that they set up a, a number of communities uh, for starter homes. The houses in Orland were considered uh, starters because they were a three bedroom, one bath with garage on one third acre, $4,000 at 4% interest. Crime was so low that people didn't even bother <coughs> locking their doors. And in, in uh, elementary school, I'd shoot home head out to play because behind my house, I had 100 undeveloped acres. So this was a, a great place to use your imagination. I built forts from scrap wood and uh, dug foxholes and prepare for fights I would have with uh, playing war with the neighborhood kids. Everyone in the neighborhood watched out for the kids. No matter who you were, where you were, your parents could get a phone call and it seems they were well connected because I could be a mile from the house and they knew what I was doing. Well, growing up, uh, we also played Army all the time and it was my intention to go in the Army because my big brother was in the Army. Most of the neighborhood was in the Army. But then uh, somebody went in the Marines and I started reading about the Marine Corps, so I felt that was for me. And um, uh, <laughs> I was a horrible student in school and if somebody would have came into school and said, Someday you're going to be an author. <laughs> it would have got more laughs than Bob Hope ever got. Yeah. But uh, uh, I never intended to write a book. It all started by accident. But um, I enlisted in the Marine Corps three months before I graduated high school. Another thing I remember about growing up was the fear of the Soviet Union. Sputnik was launched in 1957, and I remember the family headed outside to watch it traverse the night sky. It was clear the Russians were ahead of us. During the Cold War, we were taught about the possibility of being bombed, a fact which included drills at the elementary school. So we would hide under our desk or hug the wall, and that was our preparation for the bomb. If the bombs were not scary enough, Hollywood certainly helped. There were numbers of films about creatures being awakened or changed, and my favorite was about giant ants crawling under the cities and attacking people at night. And if that wasn't enough, the Japanese invented Godzilla. The beginning years of Vietnam were overshadowed by Cuba. A failed CIA-backed attempt to overthrow Fidel Castro was an embarrassment for U.S. policy. The Soviets also saw the Bay of Pigs incident as a weakness they would exploit. A year later, during a U-2 overflight of Cuba, we had evidence missile sites were being established in Cuba. The thought of nuclear missiles 90 miles from our shores could not be tolerated. An immediate naval blockade of Cuba was begun. Our military was on full alert throughout the world, as well as the Russians. The Soviets eventually did remove the missiles from Cuba, as we removed our missiles from Turkey. You remember that time as well? Well, I was kind of fortunate because uh, I didn't really care about none of that stuff. I just wanted to get out of school and go hang out in the woods. <laughs> <laughs> So that's pretty much my time period in it. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't watch a lot of footage of Vietnam because of the 15 minute delay. 
I felt guilty seeing an image of a soldier being killed that knowing 15 minutes earlier he was alive. I did witness one execution that stayed with me because of its graphic nature. Nguyen Long, chief of the South Vietnamese National Police, executed a death squad member who had just killed a policeman and his entire family. The incident heightened protest across the country. I later do remember images of the Tet Offensive, the Vietnamese New Year, with fighting in Hawaii and Saigon. Pictures of the American embassy being attacked led to questions of how well we're doing fighting this war. Oddly, we crushed the Viet Cong's ability to wage war in large-scale fights. It became the North Vietnamese War from then on. It was not long after that my roommate decided he was joining the Marines. My mother's side of the family had a prep school for West Point. So a friend and I volunteered for the draft. When I was inducted, we were asked if we would like to volunteer for the Marine Corps. After a chuckle uh, and no one stepping forward, the first 10 guys were put in the Marine Corps. I was 16th. <laughs> we found out then that when you volunteer for the draft, you could be put in any branch. So we took a uh, train ride right after that to Fort Bragg, North Carolina. We had sleeping cars, so I thought it wouldn't be this ba that bad after all. I was at the reception center for two days, uh, getting my uniform issue and haircut. There was an occasional duty, but things still weren't that bad until we came out onto a large open parking lot. And then several buses pulled up. And out of those buses poured drill sergeants. And they came at us like land sharks. They were in our face, and they stayed in our face for the next 10 weeks. I had a little problem understanding them because they sounded like uh, frogs with a strep throat, but we eventually did learn. Things became a blur as stay stretched, stretched out to 18 or 20 hours, with Sunday as a mandatory church day. Every day, the runs became longer. The drill sergeants were constantly in our faces to ensure everything was uniform and taught us that a toothbrush could be used to clean grout clean the uh, stair treads, several other uses besides cleaning your teeth. I left there and was uh, assigned to Fort Polk, which was called Tigerland. A section of the post was designed to look like a Vietnamese village. It was there I learned how to search villages, how to look for booby traps, set demolitions, and improve my shooting skills. I was disappointed in advanced infantry training because we had a senior sergeant we rarely saw and a shake and bake, or a 90-day wonder, uh, sergeant who didn't particularly push us. The training days were not as long, and the, the, most of the days were just spent marching to different ranges. Eventually, I got a, a, a graduated and assigned to Germany. I ended up being in a Nike missile base. You know, it was a, a, right on the border of Netherlands. It was a 30-man base with 26 people living off post. There were only uh, two infantry trained troops there. And our job was to uh, destroy the missiles if anything happened. The assignment was also my first traumatic event. We had a movie night on Saturdays and it was interrupted by a scream. After running to the lobby, I saw one man drop to the floor and the other man behind him with a very bloody chest. I put a chest compression on him, waited for the medic. Here, this guy had been stabbed with a butcher knife in a fight over a woman. When the medic got there, he rolled him over, and he found a severe back wound, which I missed. And that was a lesson that I never forgot. From then on, I did a full check of everybody that needed attention. Germany was not an assignment I particularly wanted, so I requested a transfer to Vietnam, and that was granted after four months. I arrived in Cameron Bay at 5 a.m. I still remember the plane door opening and being assaulted by the heat. Cameron was all sand, which frequently had a temperature exceeding 110 degrees. This was an extreme change coming from a German winter. 
I was later sent to Benoit, the main base for the 1st Cavalry Division, and given three days to adjust to the temperature. I sighted my rifle, and then I went to Quan Loy, the former home of the Michelin Plantation. <clears throat> Our base was among the miles of rubber trees. I spent the next four days flying out to try to find my company. No one knew where they were. The last day, we finally found them 50 miles from where they were last reported. They were working with an armored cavalry unit of tanks and armored personnel carriers, and they were clearing roadways uh, as they got closer to uh, Cambodia. I was with the unit for an hour when we went out to check an area where five civilian trucks had been destroyed. At dusk, we arrived. We spotted the five vehicles, and as we turned to face the wood line and dismounted, a rocket-propelled grenade hit our vehicle. People were scurrying out of the APC, and I thought I saw a guy jumping off the back. When I hit the ground and looked up, I couldn't find him. And it took me a little while, but I realized that he was underneath the vehicle. It took whatever seemed to be an age to get everybody to stop shooting, to get the other vehicles to shut off their engines so that we could hear if the guy was underneath the track. He was, and the only thing we could do for him was roll over him again. So we got him out of act, and we returned back home with one less trooper. His legs were crushed. He did live. That was his last day in Vietnam. Because we were supported by the air, we frequently moved and faced constant changing terrain. The rubber plantation was surrounded by vast areas of razor grass, a tall seven-foot grass that could cut you like a knife. There were swamps, triple canopy jungle, rice paddies, rolling mountains, and areas that were barren because of Agent Orange. In the summer, temperatures exceeded 100 degrees, up to 108 degrees. So did the humidity? Yes, the humidity was up there as well. Um, I was medevac for heat exhaustion twice. I carried up to 10 quarts of water, and was off, that was often not enough. If we were lucky, we could fill our canteens from local streams, and during the monsoon season, it rained sideways. The wind was so strong during the season, we were actually cold. And we used ponchos to keep us warm. Overall, we were poorly supplied, which my Marine friends could understand. We wore the same clothes up to uh, two months, or until they fell apart. We had one third of the radios we needed, and they were often in poor shape because of water damage. We experimented uh, with half-gallon soft canteens, but they didn't do well. We often lost a lot of our water because of a local vine called a wait-a-minute vine. It had like a two-inch uh, needle on this, this uh, vine, and it would rip open our canteens. To add interest to our lives, there were two types of scorpions, beetles with mandibles so strong that they could eat through a poncho, a variety of snakes. There was tarantulas, fire ants, centipedes that were often a foot and a half long, two types of leeches, and mosquitoes so large I thought they had Air Force insignia on them. The key to hygiene was keeping your feet dry. Immersion foot and fungus were a constant threat, and we often lost up to 5% of our men because of them having to go to the rear to take care of their feet. Any cut would become infected unless it was washed with soap and kept reasonably dry. Most combat veterans have a bad back. Mine came from carrying over 100 pounds each day. My radio and batteries weighed over 30 pounds. On top of that, I had 200 rounds of machine gun ammo, 500 rounds of rifle, Claymore mines, two, two pounds of C4, which was an explosive, four smoke grenades, four fragmentation grenades, a poncho, a hygiene kit, and up to 10 quarts of water, and a rifle and helmet. We ate canned wet food, sea rations, each meal weighing about two and a half pounds and providing 1,200 calories a meal. Most of the times that was cold too. 
Yes, yeah. There were 10 choices of meals at the time. They included things like franks and beans, ham and eggs, which were a little tough to eat, a uh, little tough to cook. So you had to eat them plain. Pork, beef slices, and then we had uh, jam, cheese and crackers, peanut butter, chocolate, pound cake. And my favorite was the cigarettes. And, and, and some of those sea rations were actually dated from World War II. That's true. Those of you old enough to remember Vietnam <clears throat> often heard of a body count. And that's how we kind of thought we could tell the public how we were winning by how many people we were killing. In order to build up the numbers, sometimes we counted them twice. And this was one way to do it, to dig up the graves. Well, I can still remember the stench as uh, we did this. And I think it was that day that I decided that the military was no longer gonna be my career. This was a true moral injury. This was against everything I stood for. When I arrived home, it was just three days from being in the field. I had some problems with protesters at the airport, but I just didn't, I didn't have anything to deal with them. I just, I just walked right past them. Soon after that, I started a series of jobs. Most of them were paramilitary. I worked in police, uh, prison, various security departments, any place where I could work alone. So I've been married since 1981, I have a son. In 1998, I had breast cancer, which led to an additional diagnosis of post-traumatic stress. I now concentrate on post-traumatic stress growth, and I work with groups like the one that Clyde has started to help other veterans, and I find that that helps me more than anything else. I have a couple boot camp stories. <laughs> I think the first one <clears throat> that when you, the, the, when you first stop and Paris Island, South Carolina, the drill instructors get on a bus and they start screaming and yelling. And I think everybody's first thought was, what the hell did I do? <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> a couple of, couple of things that stand out in my mind about boot camp was, first of all, <clears throat> I just happened to be running past my physical training instructor who was talking to my drill instructor. My physical tr training instructor said, is your drill instructor hard on you? So. <laughs> I thought right away, no matter what I say, I'm in trouble. And if I said he's too easy on me, he's gonna be harder yet. So I said, yes, sir. <laughs> and the drill instructor said, report to me when we get back. So I reported to him when we got back, and it was, it, it, his office was in like a, the barracks were like an H, and there was a uh, double. And when I reported to him, the, the, his office was in like a hallway. So he told me to do five million side straddle hops, which, jumping jacks. So uh, I, I thought to myself, I don't think I can even count that high. But I started doing them, and uh, the, the, the floors in the barracks were wooden. So after a while, I just stopped moving my arms and just kept bouncing because I felt he'd feel the vibration. Now, I don't know if it was coincidence or uh, he was waiting for me to do this. But as soon as I did that, he came out of nowhere and started punching me. And, I was off balance anyway when he hit me, so I, I fell down and he started kicking me. And then, and then he said, just get the hell back in the barracks. And uh, another thing, in, in boot camp, we had sand fleas at Paris Island, South Carolina. And sand fleas were a little tiny thing, and, and they bite and it hurt. But when you're standing at attention, there's nothing you can do about it. And sometimes they'd even go inside your ear and bite, and that would really hurt. But one time, our drill inspector, the sand fleas were having a picnic with us. We are standing in the grass by our barracks, and uh, our drill instructor happened to turn around, and one of the guys quickly hit a sand flea. <laughs> I know to us, there was a drill instructor standing behind us. So all of us, about 70 of us, had to crawl around their hands and knees looking for this dead sand flea. So I thought, this is so stupid. We're never going to find this. This is ridiculous. Well, finally, one of the guys said, sir, I found it. <laughs> and I was thinking, oh, this can't be. The drill instructor said, let me see it. He said, no, nah, the one he killed was a female. This is a male. Keep looking. <laughs> so, but <clears throat> once boot camp was finished, 
uh, everybody at that time went to infantry training. I was, when I went in, I put in for infantry, uh, machine gunner, or uh, motor transport. They put me in tanks. So after infantry training, I was told to, to report the first, uh, second tank battalion, Cape Lejeune, North Carolina. I report there, and they said, um, okay, you're in tanks, now go, you got 30 days leave, go home. So I didn't know what being in tanks meant. You know, what does that mean? They, they bring the tanks in, you clean the tracks. So <laughs> I really didn't know what my job was gonna be. When I got back, four of us came in to tanks at the same time. Now at that time, there was four people in each tank, and there was five tanks in a platoon. And a platoon of tanks was made up into two sections. The first three tanks were called the heavy section, the second two tanks were called the light section. So the normal progression was a loader, he was the lowest ranking guy in the crew, and then it was a driver, then it was a gunner, and then it was a tank commander. Well, as soon as I get in there, <clears throat> the four of us came in at the same time, all new guys. We never went to tank school, we got taught by our sergeants. And they said, uh, you're gonna be a driver. They needed a driver. So I never saw the inside of a tank before. And <laughs> they said, here's what you do, right? So I, I was made a driver. And one of the, they said, okay, you're gonna go on a mate cruise. I didn't know what a mate cruise was. And they said, well, it, it, it's, we're going over to the Mediterranean. So I said, okay, how do you get a tank on a, on a ship? And they said, you'll find out. So I, didn't, I assumed they didn't know either. But <laughs> <laughs> we loaded the tanks on the railroad cars. And this was a scary experience for me because just being out of boot camp where everybody's yelling at in infantry training, they had a concrete ramp there and they had a, a, a flat railroad car. And the tracks of the tanks hung over the railroad car six to eight inches. So you drive up this concrete ramp and you're in the front of the tank so you can see absolutely nothing but sky. And all of a sudden it comes crashing down like that, you know, and you just had a hope you had it lined up right. So we loaded the tanks on the railroad cars and we took them to Moorhead City, uh, North Carolina. And uh, the ships, when they finally came, they looked like they were probably a mile out. And the type of ship that I was on was called an LSD, and it was had a big tailgate in the back. So they opened the tailgate, and they flooded, partially flooded the ships, and small boats came out of them. Now two Mike, Mike boats were uh, came out, and uh, one larger one, and the two Mike boats and the larger boat pulled up on shore, and they dropped the ramps, and we backed the tanks up on the smaller Mike boats down, and. Uh, they raised the ramp in the front of them, and then they backed off, and then they drove the boats into the back of the ship, and then they raised the tailgate and pumped the water out, and we chained the tanks to the boats and chained the boats to the tanks, and away we went for the Mediterranean. Sit down. So, I mean, this is kind of cool, because here you are 18, 19 years old, and you get to see all these foreign countries, see how people live. So it was great. and. Uh, <laughs> I, I hung out with a friend who was got us in so much trouble. But fortunately for him, when we went to see the commanding officer, he made it sound like it was so funny that the commanding officer <laughs> never really got us in too much trouble. So I learned quickly to shut my mouth and let him do the talking. But uh, I was on a med cruise and we for six months. We came back for six months. Then I went back on another med cruise for six months. I came back from the med cruise and they made me uh, a brig guard for six weeks. And uh, then they sent me up to try out for the Marine Corps silent drill team. And I wanted nothing to do with that. And that was nothing but spit and polish, you know? And here I was in tanks, you know, where you get dirty diesel fuel all over you. So I wanted nothing to do with them. So I begged them to let me come back. Those of you who don't know, the Marine Corps Silent Drill Team puts on a, a, a drill every Friday, and they spend six hours of that day just getting their uniforms ready. And they do nothing but drill, nothing but drill. And uh, I said, look, I came in the Marine Corps to go to Vietnam for my country. I said, I don't wanna spend my time here because I, I was already in for like two and a half years, two years. 
soon after I got orders for Vietnam. I arrived in Vietnam in the middle of Tet of 1968. And for those of you that may not know, 1968 and 1969 were the heaviest fighting in the whole Vietnam War. And I left after Tet of 1969. First full day in Vietnam, we arrived, we got off the plane, we got sent to this big, large building, we spent the night there. Then they told me to wait out front for a Jeep, you're going to battalion headquarters. So I'm waiting out front and all these Jeeps come and I say, first tanks? And they said no. So finally I just waited and finally a Jeep pulled up said first tanks. So they took us to, uh, uh, by the way in that barracks there was probably uh, a couple hundred people and I knew nobody, absolutely nobody. But um, I arrived at uh, my battalion headquarters and the staff sergeant came in and said you might as well pick a rack because you're going to spend the night. So I started picking a rack out and another staff sergeant came in that came over on the plane with me. So I kind of knew him a little bit and I was happy to see somebody I knew. And uh, we were talking and a warrant officer came in and he said, <laughs> I need two volunteers to man a tank. He said, I have two, but I need two volunteers. So I was like, oh, no way, no way. My, my first, first full day in Vietnam, no way. And uh, the staff sergeant said, I'll volunteer. And he said, he will too. <laughs> so it was the only time in the Marine Corps we took one, a single tank out. And the staff sergeant was the tank commander. And I asked to be the loader so I could sit on the tank and see what's going on. So we drove out to this compound that was about 13 miles southwest of Da Nang. And there was a tower there. And there was 12 infantry manning the tower and us four people in the tank. So at this tower, there was a real steep drop off and then a river and on the other side of it, there was jungles. And on the, on the sides of us, there's steep ravines too. So we're sitting there and, and the staff sergeant goes up in the tower to see what's going on. And there was 12 infantry there because two men manned the tower at all times and they rotated. And they had starlight scopes so they could see at night. But finally, the people in the tower spotted a, a North Vietnamese soldier across the river watching something with binoculars. He was up in a tree and they called Da Nang and asked if we could fire on him with the tanks and they said no because there's an American patrol too close to him. So the staff sergeant went up the tower and he comes back and he, he didn't look very happy. I said what's up and he said uh, they just got an intelligence report in the tower that said there was a battalion of North Vietnamese coming our way with civilians. And I'm thinking, I don't know how many is in a North Vietnamese battalion, but they're, they're going to go through us like nothing. I honestly thought, wow, the people got back home are going to say this guy couldn't even last two days over there. Pretty soon we saw, it, it, it looked like this, this rope coming out of the sky. And I never saw nothing like that before. I didn't know what it was. And here it was codenamed Puff. It was a C-130 with mini guns on it. Every fifth round was a tracer. And it, but it was firing so fast, it looked like a line of rope, a uh, fluorescent rope. Then artillery started firing over us, and I know once in a while they get short rounds. So I thought, you know, uh, you know, the, 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 I hope they know what they're doing. But pretty soon they, the, the sky lit up with the aerial flares, and, and uh, jets came in with strafing runs and bombing runs. And uh, I, I, I honestly thought to myself, this is my, Sec first full day in Vietnam and my last. Um, but the staff sergeant said, uh, <clears throat> get some sleep, I'll take the first watch. And I was amazed, I actually did fall asleep. But I was at, when it was my watch, I was like, it's so dark you can't see, nothing. You know, and, and this is all new to me, the jungles and uh, the, all the sounds and the smells. And, and I, I kept thinking, they could come up the ravines and they could be five feet from me and I'd never see them. I hope they don't come on my watch because I don't want to be responsible. But my watch was over and uh, I was amazed I fell back to sleep again. I woke up, the sun shining. I said to the staff sergeant, what happened? He said, I guess they broke them up with artillery. So that was my first full day in Vietnam. The worst day I had ever in my life I was a tank commander. We were in an operation with a company of infantry and two tanks. We had a lieutenant with, but he was new in country, so he left me run the show. And we sat there as a blocking force for um, several hours. And then we got a call that said, come on back in, which we were happy about because we were expected to sit, sleep alongside the tank, eat cold sea rations and uh, sleep on the ground. And uh, so we're heading back in. 
I asked the lieutenant if he wanted his guys to ride on the tank. And he said, of course. So they rode on the tank. And we're coming back in. And uh, everybody was all happy because we're getting to go back to showers and warm meals. All of a sudden, I remember taking a deep breath of air, and it was all very hot air. And everything started getting fuzzy. And, and I, I remember thinking to myself, uh-oh, this is it. And the next thing I, my, I remembered, my life was like a brown blob. And I started talking to myself, saying, come on, you got to snap out of this. You can't let go. You can't do this. And <laughs> it seemed to me like I talked to myself for 20 minutes. How long it actually was, I don't know. But that's what my life looked like, just like a brown blob. And uh, finally, I remember seeing a little bit of light. And what it reminded me of is when you drink a glass of water, you look down through the bottom of it. Everything was all distorted. And finally, I started to function. And I remember looking around, and I saw people laying all over the place. And I, I didn't understand what happened. I saw people's mouths moving, but I couldn't hear a word. So uh, finally, it took me a long time to realize we, we hit a mine, but I didn't understand because I never heard the explosion. I was, I should have jumped down and started helping people and stuff, but I was just like in a daze. I, I, and, and back then, if you weren't bleeding profusely, you were fine. But that was the worst day of my life. Uh, the mine we hit, it blew the first three road wheels off the tank. The, the tank was laying in a hole probably uh, three feet deep and five feet round. They estimated the explosives be between 30 and 50 pounds, and I was like 11 feet away from that. So I was never the same person after that. After that, I started just trusting everybody. I, I, I wanted to be by myself. I didn't want to be around nobody. Um, I hated everything. I couldn't remember things, too. And they, they gave me orders for drill instructor school, and I knew I could not make it through drill instructor school with my memory the way it was, and, and I was just not the same person after that mine explosion. So I opted to get out of the Marine Corps, and coming home from Vietnam was the worst time in my life. I hated everybody, I hated myself. I uh, drank way too much, and to this day, I hate being in big crowds of people or loud noise, but it was a horrible time for me. And, and I actually contemplated suicide so much because I just felt life isn't worth the effort. It seemed like everybody else, it took me four times the effort to do the same thing everybody else did. So I, I contemplated it, and the only thing that ever stopped me from committing suicide was the fact that I felt God put us here for a reason, and it wouldn't be right for us to cut that reason short. But <clears throat> I struggled through m most of my life. I had a very, very hard life. Eventually, I became a mentor for the Lehigh County District Attorney's Office to mentor veterans. And what it is a program, when a veteran gets in trouble with the law, they put another veteran with them to mentor him along and kind of straighten him out. But I thought, why, why shouldn't we get them before they get in trouble with the law? Why shouldn't we get them before they're ready to commit suicide? So well, I was instrumental in starting this organization called the Veterans Brotherhood. So what we do is we take veterans off the streets that have absolutely nothing, nowhere to go, no food, and we put them up in a hotel for a few days and we evaluate them for what's best for their future. In our first year, we took 18 veterans off the streets and some of those now have jobs going to school and uh, have their own apartments. But our biggest thing is, is, is veteran suicides. and. We're like first responders because there's a lot of organizations that help veterans, but very few of them take veterans off the street immediately. Most of them they have to go through a, a, a administrative process or something like that. So we take them off the streets when they're at their lowest and have absolutely nothing. Bob's vice president, as we said, and we're working on a film now about post-traumatic stress disorder. And the reason we're doing that is because so many veterans have a hard time talking to their families about their experiences. So we want to film so that their families can see what their son or daughter's possibly going through and look for warning signs of suicides. So we, we, we feel this film is, uh, for the money we're putting into it, is the best thing we could do because the film will be around for 10, 20 years helping veterans. 
And uh, I can't think of a better way to reach out and help so many veterans. And it's not just for veterans. We're trying to reach the larger community. It's for police officers, first responders, anybody that's been in a trauma. And we, we hope to reach them through the film. He yeah. went through Tet, I went through Tet, and I got stuck in Cape. Well, we were recon. So, yeah. like you were saying with the NVA, we spotted them when they, after the Tet, when they were bringing more troops in, and we were stuck out there for five, well, recon's like five, five, six of us. And then they, we were out there for five days, and we worked our way back and got the case on. We stayed there for, I stayed there 20 some days out of the 77 day siege. And then after that, we worked our way up to Way City, got stuck in that, because we had no way to get out. <clears throat> trapped. You were in a five-man team or a six-man team? Five, six, what we caught. Yeah, just like the SEALs. Army has the Rangers, Navy has the SEALs, and Marines has recon. Right. Five guys, you know, put their camouflage on, go out, observe, try not to make contact. But a lot of times, you know, they see the helicopters, you know, yourself, helicopters come in, they see, and either VC or NVA follow you, and they just sneak up on to try to catch it. We just try to observe, see what's going on, and then report back what we see. That's what started the whole thing in Quezon. We were seeing that, and that's why West Moore at the time wanted all the Marines up at Quezon yes. to yes. stop them, because he knew they were coming in from the, uh, North Vietnam at the time. He figured once they get down there, they're going to work their way south. In 1967, there was 9,000 American casualties. In 1968, there was 14,500. In 1969, there was 10,000. So in that three-year period, you had 33,643 American uh, casualties, which is over half of what all the whole Vietnam War in that three-year period. Just what was a typical day in the sense that, I guess you didn't go back to a base in a day, so were you constantly, in a sense, sort of traveling to the next place but been out there for days? and. And what, what did that look like for each other? Well, for me, uh, because I was part of the Air Cavalry, uh, we were uh, we called it being logged or supplied every three days. Uh, so we, we often stayed out from 30 to 60 days. And when we got back, uh, it was to a forward fire base, which could be quite small and might have a few artillery pieces on it. And we just helped build the base for two or three nights, and then we're out again. So most of our time was just trying to search. He, he was talking about the insects over there. I remember laying in one of the bunkers in, in, in a, a cot in a bunker, and I felt something on my chest. I looked down, and it was a thousand layer about this long. Mm -hmm. And the guy said, "Don't hit it because it'll bite you, and they're poisonous." So I thought about taking my 45 and try to shoot it off. <laughs> I thought that wasn't a very good idea either. But uh, we were all over the place. We were constantly uh, moving here, moving there. Could both of you gentlemen share how you dealt with in your inner feelings when you came back from your tour of duty and the tide was not only turning against the war, but there was actually some open hostility to returning veterans? I have one word for that, alcohol. I shared in that as well. <laughs> that and I hung around veterans. Things didn't turn around for me until I went back to college. My mother found a program at Temple. It was strictly yeah. for veterans who didn't do well in high school. It grouped veterans together, classes together, until they matriculated. It was quite successful. Uh, the average uh, uh, GPA was 3.5. It helped me. I mean, it got me back to socializing again and to a larger community. I'm wondering about the post-traumatic stress disorder, specifically um, how prevalent is it and, and if there's been any studies about what percentage of vets in combat, for example, might, might be expected to eventually develop it, or is it we too still early in that, that, uh, that kind of mass data? When we were in Vietnam, for every guy in the combat arms, there were at least seven in the supporting arms. Mm -hmm. right, so their stress was separation from home. I mean, there were a lot of forward fire bases that were not too nice, and they, they were in danger of, of uh, being mortared. But the, the further out you got, the better chances are that you would get the PTS. 
I would, I would say that's normal. It's multiple traumas. Did you guys ever cry or feel like crying or just... Sure felt like it a lot, but I never did. Certainly not in front of the guy. No, no, and he said he went in the back and he cried by himself. He, and the reason why was because his squad was cut down and there were two KIAs and three WIAs. And he said he just walked off and for the first time he cried. I guess he might have felt responsible or what have you. We'll never know. Because uh, a mortar got him three days later. But I, I, I often think of that, like eight months, you know, and he cried. Right. I didn't cry until... Uh, it was during uh, the dedication of the Vietnam Wall. Uh, a civilian came out and thanked me for my service, and I just lost it. But prior to that, I, I couldn't shed a tear. A lot of the firemen, younger guys that come out, it's like, come on over to American Legion. Now you're 20, 30 years old. American Legion, that's for the old time. That's like, they remind you of like a bar, right. where the veterans go to a bar, sit around and drink. That's what their mentality is. A lot of the younger guys don't know nothing about transferring their life insurance when they get out of service, they transfer it over with benefits. Now, could we handle a couple more Iraqi kids you know, committed suicide, like he was saying? You know, couldn't stand the pressure. Two years ago, same thing. Kid killed himself, they wiped him, you know, no insurance, he dropped the insurance, you know, paid out the money, helped him, had the Christmas funding for him, for his three kids. It's, it's a shame. You know, kids, they, they don't, just like you and I, we got out, they say, oh, okay, all you want to do is give me my discharge, baby. Give me my DD-214, I'm getting out. And go home. Then he said, look, transfer this $10,000 at the time, life insurance policy, transfer it over to full life. You know, I figured that was cheap, but a dollar something a month. See, they don't tell nobody that. They just want to get in and get out. What do you do when you see a service dog? Most people don't know, but you should not touch it, pet it, talk to it, or anything. You should leave it alone because if he's paying attention to you, he's not paying attention to what he's trained for. Now, he's mine for post-traumatic stress disorder and traumatic brain injury. I've been going to psychiatrists and therapists. He, he does more for me than any of them do. If I took his vest off, he'd run around here licking everybody. <laughs> what do you think should be taught in schools about the Vietnam War and the whole Vietnam time period? The truth. In the Ken Burns film, one thing that bothered me is they said North Vietnam did a peaceful takeover of South Vietnam. That was not true. They slaughtered millions of people. Was there good things about that? What did you, is there anything, would you ever go back for example? For, for, for me, I was more comfortable in the war in Vietnam than I was in my own country when I came back. And, and the, the, the one thing that <clears throat> made it that way is because in Vietnam, you're working together. You're helping everybody out. You're, you, you, you're trying to keep everybody alive. They're trying to keep you alive. And it seems like when you come home, everybody's trying to stab you in the back. Everybody's, uh, you know, and that was hard for me to get used to because I was just out of high school when I was in the Marine Corps, you know. And then I come home to, to, to all that. That was I was more comfortable. I was, I would have went back to Vietnam in a second rather than live here. That's a great question. Uh, for me, it was being thrown together with people I would never break bread with, and uh, got to meet people from different cultures, races, that uh, they became my friends. Uh, they, I'll just never forget those moments. And it was a changing event for me. I appreciate it. Thank you,